Hello Oilers fans, Austin here and the Edmonton Oilers are moving on to round two. They defeat the LA Kings last night by a score of four to three. Welcome to the day after discussion and also kind of series recap video that I will be doing today. I'm going to be breaking down how this series played out. I'll go through a lot of the numbers and stats. I uh, got some stats from SportLogic. Uh, they're kind of like a private uh, data tracking site um, and I'm excited to share some of that information. I did find it from x.com but I do have some fun stats for all of you nerds like me but also there's gonna be a lot of other things to talk about as well especially when it comes to you know content now that the Oilers are waiting for their round two opponent of course they will be waiting for the Vancouver Canucks or the Nashville Predators not sure who yet as of the recording of this video uh game six is in Nashville I believe tomorrow night which would be Friday uh May 3rd so while the Oilers wait for their next opponent what type of content would you like to see from me do you want me to live stream other games other teams other you know the other Canadian teams uh I would be I would love to do more content like that do you want me to do like series recap videos on the other series that have already completed Completed. Just let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always, if you like these day after discussion videos, make sure you hit like, make sure you hit subscribe, and of course, uh, tell someone that you love them as always. So let's get into uh, this game, and then I'm going to discuss a lot of the uh, other aspects of the series between the Oilers and Kings. So in this game, the Oilers won 4-3. The Kings at one point had a 2-1 lead in the second period. But I think the turning point in the game, honestly, was Pierre-Luc Dubois' penalty after the Oilers had tied the game at two. Uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois took one of the dumbest penalties I've ever seen. And then he was yapping to the referee about it and then smiling and laughing when he went to the penalty box. And for Kings fans, I am so sorry that you have to deal with Pierre-Luc Dubois. He ended up finishing the series for the Kings with one goal, um, four shots on net. Uh, in the final four games of the series, I think he had one shot on goal. So if you're a Kings fan and you are watching Pierre-Luc Dubois, he's making over $8 million a year, and he put on a performance like that, I would not be very happy as a fan. Um, if you're the Oilers, you take it. Obviously, Dreisaitl, he scored his second of the night as his penalty it was expiring, and um, the Oilers took that 3-2 lead. They did not look back the rest of the game. They made it 4-2, and then, of course, they just locked it down in the third period. That third period was a masterclass in defensive structure for Edmonton. Uh, the LA Kings, they were generating nothing. They couldn't even properly like enter the Oilers zone until there was about three minutes left in the third, and then they were able to push a little bit. They scored one goal to make it a one-goal game. Uh, they got that deflection in front of the net. Nurse kind of went down to one knee instead of staying more upright to block the shot. Just missed him and went by Stuart Skinner. And then, of course, the Kings, that first goal that they scored in the first period, it was a hard rim around the boards. It hit a stanchion. Skinner came out of his net to play the puck, and it bounced right to the front of the, 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 like the, the, front of the crease, and it was just put in by, uh, I believe it was uh, Laferriere, I think was who it was. But either way, the Kings, uh, they had some luck on their side, but also the Kings did come out strong. They actually were controlling this game. I thought they had a good first period, and I thought the first like five minutes of the second period, they continued to control the puck, and they were giving the Oilers fits in terms of you know not allowing Edmonton to really get set up. But then they get into penalty trouble, and that was, I mean, that was like the keys to the game in my pregame report. I said LA needs to stay out of the box. Uh, special teams have absolutely been the difference maker in this series, and special teams were the difference maker in Game Five. Obviously, even if you're an Oilers fan, you're very happy Edmonton is moving on, but it also feels very business like today. It doesn't feel you know, as exciting as previous series wins have felt in oil country. Uh, it's almost like this is an expectation right now. And, you know, obviously I'm very happy. I was very happy last night before I went to bed. But, you know, I woke up this morning and, you know, you kind of realize there's still a lot of work to do. It's just one round. And if you're the Oilers, like you you are just you're focusing on round two. And uh, hopefully you can go on a deep run here. So uh, it's cup or bust right that's kind of the the been the motto here and uh hopefully Empton can continue to uh play well I thought they played well overall against the Kings obviously there's a lot of parts of their game uh that can improve but um when you know you don't want to pick a part of win too much but let's kind of get into the, like the extra advanced stats here so the stats directly above my head that's from sport logic so offensive zone possession time the kings had 34 minutes 22 seconds to the oilers 32 minutes 14 seconds of offensive zone possession um and that is in all situations so power play penalty kill even strength five on five now uh the kings uh it, that kind of makes sense they, they did have a lot of possession time in the oilers zone 
But look at the slot shots. The Oilers in this series had 71 shots from the slot. The Kings only had 49. The Oilers had 51 cycle chances, and the Kings had 33. So that means when we look at the offensive zone possession time, the Oilers had less offensive zone possession, but they had more cycle chances than the Kings. So the Kings were getting a lot of offensive zone time, and they were cycling the puck a lot. However, they were never able to really get that puck into scoring areas. They weren't able to get it into the slot area as much as I think they would have liked. Uh, the Oilers were really good their box plus one defensive formation um worked to a t they kept la to the outside for the most part throughout the entire series they kept them to the perimeter and outside of a couple lucky goals for the kings um the oilers they the oilers could have swept this series this could have been a 4-0 series uh credit to the kings though they did not go away they did not back down even uh when they were down by two in the third last night they were trying to push that the, you know they gave the oilers fits in the neutral zone and um, that's a testament to the LA Kings and just the style that they play. Very tough opponent. Um, and the expected goals in the entire series, 16.7 in favor uh, for the Oilers, 10.3 for the Kings. Um, and the Oilers, of course, they scored 22 goals on 16.7 expected goals. So they were about 5.3 goals above expected. And the Kings scored 13 goals. So they were 2.7 goals above expected in that series. Now, when we look at the expected goals for percentage, uh, again, this is all situations. The Oilers just 61.85% expected goals for percentage really shows along with the other stats that, yes, the Oilers not only deserved to win, but they were producing the majority of the high danger scoring chances. Uh, Empton's power play went nine for 12 in this series, nine for 12. That is unbelievable. And then the penalty kill, of course, went 12 for 12. Uh, they did not give up a single uh, power play goal against. And that is the first time in franchise history that the team has done that in a playoff series. And as I mentioned, goals for 22, goals against 13. Uh, the Oilers' Corsi 4 percentage was 46.71%, and their shots on goal percentage was 51.67%. So Corsi 4 percentage, uh, that's just all shot attempts, whether it's been blocked or not. Uh, the Kings had the shot attempt advantage, but they were down in a lot of these games, and they were pushing, and when a team is desperate, they throw the puck kind of from everywhere on the ice. Score effects takes over if you're the Oilers. Game one, they had that huge lead. They were up really big in the third. It was 6-2 in the third. The Oilers were sitting back. Uh, and then, of course, game four, uh, the Oilers won one nothing, but uh, they only had 13 shots on goal. The Kings, the whole game were pushing, could not beat Stuart Skinner. And like I mentioned, a couple, um, a couple breaks for the Kings allowed them to stay in this series a little bit closer than I think maybe the advanced stats would uh, sh suggest. So if you're the Kings um, and you're a Kings fan, and what do you think your team needs to do to improve in the offseason? Do you think Jim Hiller comes back as head coach? Do you think they'll continue to run the 1-3-1 uh, neutral zone system heading into next year? Now, the Kings, they did in game four. They they got rid of the 1-3-1. They, they weren't really playing that at all. They were incredibly aggressive. And then last night, they weren't really playing the 1-3-1 until they went up to 1. The the Kings went up to 1, and then they started to go back into the 1-3-1. And I thought that was super interesting because they had been so effective at pushing the pace and not playing the 1-3-1 when they went away from it. They went back to it. They got into penalty trouble. The Oilers capitalized. They got the lead, and the Kings just didn't look comfortable from the rest of the game. Um, but if you're the Oilers, you have to be happy with your special teams. I don't know how you can't be happy with your special teams. You didn't give up a single power play goal against. Uh, so, and the power play clicked at nine for 12. I know two of the goals that Empton scored last night were not on the power play, but they, they were scored within a second or two of a power play ending. So, I mean, they were like an unofficial, unofficial, official, unofficial power play goal. I guess this is what I wanted to say, but here's all the advanced stats. You can take a quick look. You can pause the screen if you want to, just to like get a better read on it. But I am going to move into the Game 5 recap screen here. So, Emden wins the series four games to one. They won last night four to three. Down at the bottom of the screen, those are the uh, advanced stats for last night's game um, individually. So, last night, the Oilers had a 56.12 expected goals four percentage. High danger, Corsi 4 was 58.33%. Corsi 4 percentage was only 40.24%, but it didn't matter. Obviously, the expected goals in the high danger, Corsi 4, uh, matters a lot more than just regular Corsi. And then scoring chances 4 was 50%. Dead even on the scoring chances, but the Oilers had the higher high danger looks or the uh, you know more quality high danger looks. So the topics in this brief uh, discussion, and by brief, I mean, this is probably going to go on for like 10 minutes, uh, three straight years. 
Leon Dreisaitl, Connor McDavid, special teams, Derek Ryan, what's next, and my closing thoughts. So three straight years is where I will start. The Oilers have defeated the LA Kings for three straight years in the postseason. In 2022, Edmonton beat LA in seven games. Last year, the Oilers beat LA in six games, and this year in five games. So if they happen to meet next year, fourth fourth straight season, uh, I imagine Edmonton will sweep and go 4-0, right? That's kind of how that works. You know, seven, six, five, and then four. Uh, mostly kidding. I really hope Edmonton and LA um, meet someone else in the playoffs next season in round one. I would not like to just keep playing LA. N- nothing against LA. And it's not like the, the series isn't exciting or has its moments. But this is a rivalry that's just, I'm as a fan, I'm just kind of... You know, I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm bored of, but I am getting sick of this team having to play the Kings every single year in the first round. Um, but for the Kings, of course, you know, there's they did a retool on the fly. Tom McClellan had that team rolling this season. They got off to a terrific start. Then they really struggled. They fired McClellan. Jim Hiller took over. Um, they're playing this 1-3-1. Uh, the LA Kings don't look like a team that should be built for a 1-3-1. Uh, that team has a lot of good pieces, got a lot of younger pieces, skilled pieces. Is that they should be driving play on the four check, uh, keeping them in a like you know, uh, passive uh, four checking formation, and then also having them just sit back and play a one three one in the neutral zone doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, especially in today's NHL where most teams are built around speed and skill. So, uh, for the Kings, not sure what the answers are, not sure what you do moving forward. I don't know if Jim Hiller comes back and for Rob Blake, who's been general manager for the last few years, I don't know if Rob Blake comes back. Um, some interesting decisions, especially with Pierre Luc Dubois. Do you buy him out already? Like, is that something that Kings fans are going to be looking at? Do you buy out Pierre Luc Dubois one year into his contract? It's um, it might be tempting because he was invisible. And for someone that's going to make or is making as much as he does, uh, not a good showing from Pierre Luc Dubois. I do want to give a shout out though, uh, Anze Kopitar. He played really well. Uh, he always shows up. And Drew Doughty, I thought he played really good hockey as well. Drew Doughty is always an absolute pest. He's always uh, all over the Oilers all the time. And last night's game, it felt like he was on the ice for literally three quarters of the game. Every time I was watching him uh, and the puck would go into the King zone, it looked like Drew Doughty was always the one that was back getting that puck so uh if you're the kings not sure what the future has in store i am curious and excited to see your future uh the kings have always been a pretty neutral team for me i don't dislike the kings and uh for kings fans um let me know your thoughts in the comment section as well i do want to hear from kings fans specifically uh just kind of what your overall thoughts on the series were what you think your team needs to do uh, to improve, and uh, we'll go from there. Now, the next topic I want to talk about is Leon Dreisaitl. Dreisaitl is a big game player. Uh, he shows up in these moments. He had two goals last night for the Oilers, and in the last 18 playoff games against the LA Kings, um, he has 17 goals, which is outrageous. I mean, Leon Dreisaitl in the playoffs against the LA Kings, just that's just insane to me. 17 goals in 18 games against a team that, you know, touts their defensive style and really good on the penalty kill. Leon Dreisaitl's absolutely feasted on them. So is Connor McDavid as well. McDavid had 11 assists in this series, which is, I think, the sixth most assists in a single playoff series um, in NHL history. So Dreisaitl and McDavid, uh, they... Three years in a row, the LA Kings had no answer for them. They could not slow those two down. Uh, the Oilers' two superstars show up when it matters. LA, I, I mean, Dreisaitl, he finished the series with five goals, five assists. Uh, Connor McDavid had one goal, but he had 11 assists, so Connor McDavid was dishing the puck. Would like to see McDavid shoot it just a little bit more, but I did like Connor McDavid's game a lot. Uh, there's a, you know... He looks he looks good. He looks solid. He looks like McDavid and Dreisaitl. He looks confident when he was skating down the ice with the open net. And then uh, I think it was Philip Deneau ended up hooking him down, preventing him from scoring the empty net goal. Dreisaitl, I love it as he's spinning around on his knees. He does the like fist pump like he because he, he knows drawing that penalty with 19 seconds left. He, he understood the impact that that had. He celebrated like it was a goal, even though he did not score a goal. I saw some fans saying that that should have just been awarded a goal but he was not in on his own. It, you know, I understand why you'd want that to just be given a goal to Dreisaitl, give him the hat trick. Um, but, you know, for Dreisaitl, he doesn't care. Uh, he cares about the win. He's incredibly competitive. And I want to talk about Dreisaitl's uh, defensive game as well, especially in games 
um, three, four, and five. Those three games specifically, Leon Dreisaitl was so good on the back check. He was so good at getting back in the neutral zone, stripping players on the back check, getting down low and supporting his defensemen. I thought Leon Dreisaitl played the best hockey of his entire career. Uh, I thought he even looked better than he did in that series against the Calgary Flames two years ago, where I, he put up a ridiculous stat line against the, the Flames and was it five games? I can't remember what it was. It was 16 points in five games or something is what he had. It was just a crazy stat line um, when he was playing on that uh, busted leg, that high ankle sprain. But Dreisaitl, I, I have so many good things to say about Dreisaitl. I thought this was the best playoff series he's played, in my opinion. Uh, I thought he looked great. He's been holding that second line together. Him, Nuge, and um, Evander Kane have their moments. They've looked good. Evander Kane scored last night and scored kind of a weird one, kind of shoveled one towards the net, and Riddick went off Riddick's pad, and then he kind of like slid himself into the net, and then the puck kind of like went in behind the line too. Uh, but for Leon Dreisaitl, great game, great series. Love that, and uh, I just love his competitive nature. He, he goes beast mode in the playoffs. He always has throughout his career. Uh, I remember his first playoff run in 2017 with the team uh just you know the amount of production that he put up against the Anaheim Ducks in round two of course the Oilers lost in seven to the Ducks that year but dry settle he's worth every penny he is severely undervalued by I think a lot of this fan base sometimes especially when it comes to the defensive side of the game because it, it can look like he's being you know quote-unquote lazy uh I've never thought that he's been a lazy player I do think that sometimes he gets in that well, you know, I, I sometimes in the regular season, he might not show up the way he should on a regular basis. But when he shows up, holy smokes, man, Dreisaitl is an absolute game changer. He's a difference maker. And Empton is uh, very lucky to have him right now. Be very curious to see what his next contract looks like. And I do believe he will resign. Uh, next up, Connor McDavid. As I mentioned, he had 11 assists this series. He only had one goal. Uh, so if you're, you know, an Oilers fan hoping for more goals for McDavid, I would say that he is due. And speaking of saying that he is due, last night, someone in the chat after the first period, they said Connor McDavid hasn't looked really McDavid like for the last two games, um, referring to game four. And then at that point in the game, game five. And I replied to that commenter. I was like, well, that just means Connor McDavid is due. And do he was, he ended up having two assists in the second period and um, he finishes with 11 in the series. He played phenomenal hockey. He leads the playoffs in scoring right now. Zach Hyman leads in goals. He has seven, uh, but for Connor McDavid, that top line, McDavid, Hyman and Henrique, um, they got the ball rolling against the Kings in game one. Connor McDavid had, was it that five assists in, in the first game? Now, the Kings, they did start to slow him down just a little bit. He wasn't as uh, effective. Obviously, he didn't have any other game where he had five assists in a game like he did in the first game of the series. But Connor McDavid, um, you know, shows up every single night, does everything he can to help this team win. And with the ups and downs of this season for him, uh, remember back in November, he was barely a point per game. Uh, he looked sick. Uh, he looked injured at some point. He missed a couple games in October. Uh, so for Connor McDavid, seeing him at this level again with Leon Dreisaitl, the Oilers are in such good hands. And not only for the two superstars as well, like them, like Dreisaitl and McDavid playing at an elite level, top tier, 120% every shift. That's a good thing. But the Oilers depth has also come around as well. Uh, special teams was a huge factor in the series against the Kings. I just have like cat hair flying all around my face right now. Oh my God, this is really scary. I don't know where it all came from. <laughs> Uh, but speaking of special teams, uh, that was really the X factor, the difference maker in this series against LA, uh, the Oilers went 45% on the power play, 100% on the penalty kill. And, um, you know, last night, a couple of the goals for the Oilers were not technically on the power play, but they were scored as power plays were expiring. And, um, if Empton can continue to play really strong on the special teams now, Obviously, 45% power play is not sustainable. The Oilers will not shoot at that rate as the playoffs continue. And I am curious to see uh, how games start getting called as the playoffs progress. The Oilers, they they did have eight more power plays than the Kings did. Now, of course, I've seen some Kings fans complain about the officiating, saying that, you know, like they, they weren't happy with the officiating. They thought that there was too many calls that went in favor of the Oilers. Um, my argument to that is look at the penalties that they did call, though, and especially against L.A. A lot of the penalties that L.A. was taking, they were either out of frustration or they're just like obvious calls that you have to call. Uh, game three kind of got out of hand. They didn't call the 
penalties that they should have. They gave out a lot of penalties that maybe they shouldn't have. Um, but for the Oilers, they took advantage. They made the team pay. And uh, the Kings, they just could not stay out of the box. The Oilers stayed disciplined. They weren't getting into it after whistles. Uh, they, they weren't allowing the Kings to get under their skin. Uh, no one on the Oilers were really retaliating. I mean, look at Evander Kane in Game 3 when he was slew foot by Lazat. He gets up. Now, he's mad at the ref that the ref didn't make a call. But Evander Kane, in the regular season and even last year or the year before, his uh, temperament he would have retaliated. He would have skated after someone. He would have started something. Uh, maybe after the whistle, he would have tried to fight someone. Like that's just that's just how Evander Kane was. Evander Kane would have retaliated in that situation. But Evander Kane, he stayed disciplined. He did not retaliate. Of course, he ended up uh, fighting Anglin, who had shot at him in the neutral zone a bit later in that game. Uh, but for Evander Kane, a lot of growth there. And I think Chris Knobloch, his message and you know what he's preaching right now to the team is just focus on hockey, focus on playing hockey, uh, win the game, make them pay on the scoreboard. And that's exactly what the Oilers have been doing when they do get the power play and their penalty kill. I cannot say enough good things about it. Every single unit on the penalty kill has been phenomenal. Uh, Vin Vinny DeHarnay, he was my unsung hero of round one for the Oilers. Now the advanced stats, they're not going to you know look amazing for Vinny DeHarnay, but I did think that that was his best, um, you know, his best segment of five games in an Oilers uniform in his entire career. Vinny DeHarnay on the um, on the penalty kill at even strength, uh, just breaking up the cycle, breaking up plays in the slot area, not allowing the puck to get to scoring areas. I thought Vinny DeHarnay had a terrific playoff series. So um, for Dry Settle, McDavid, and their special teams, it's been key, and hopefully that they can continue that. Now the next player I want to talk about is Derek Ryan. Last night. The Oilers were defending a one-goal lead. The LA had just scored late, scored with two minutes left to make it a one-goal game, and they continued to push. Uh, late in the third period, as the Oilers are defending, the LA Kings are cycling. Derek Ryan's stick breaks, and he's been and he was out there. He was caught out there for a while. He could not get to the bench. He could not get a new stick, and he was just using his body to prevent kind of shooting and passing lanes. And then uh, Kopitar, he cycles the puck around. It goes to the half wall on the right side in the Oilers zone. And Derek Ryan, he throws his body without a stick and then manages to kick the puck up to Dreisaitl, who's able to skate it out of the zone, draw that late power play, and kind of seal the game for the Oilers. Without Derek Ryan's effort there, um, playing without a stick, he played without a stick, and that was some of the best hockey I've seen, not only from Derek Ryan, but from any NHL player. It was clutch. I just wanted to give a shout-out because because for Derek Ryan, that was just amazing, amazing play. Uh, his on-ice awareness, his defensive awareness, Derek Ryan, you love to see it. You love to see it. Would would Sam Carrick have been able to do something like that too? Maybe. But Sam Carrick was not in the lineup two games in a row. They put Derek Ryan in two games in a row. Uh, the Oilers obviously got that shutout in game four. And then last night, Derek Ryan came up absolutely clutch. He's the reason why Dry Settle was able to get that puck out of the zone. Um, prevent the Kings from tying this game up and also allow Dry Settle to skate out and draw that late power play to seal the series for Edmonton. So for Derek Ryan, we love Derek Ryan. Um, just don't know what else to say about him. Just so good. Uh, I was so excited on the live stream last night watching that. It was incredible. Um, so what is next? I know I kind of touched on this at the beginning of the video uh, when it comes to the type of content that you want to see until Edmonton, you know, plays in round two. Of course, when round two starts or just before it starts, once Edmonton uh, knows who their opponent is, whether it's Nashville or Vancouver, I will be doing a full series preview video, just like I did with the Kings. I'm going to break down uh, the series season series between the two teams, uh, the stats against each other throughout the regular season. Of course, if Edmonton plays Vancouver, we know Vancouver went 4-0 against the Oilers. Uh, if it is against the Nashville Predators, I actually don't remember what Edmonton went against the Predators this year. I think it was 2-1, and one, but I'd have to double check. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to future content, while we wait for that, and also in between, too, I know um, sometimes when there's two days off between games and the playoffs for Edmonton, that second day off, I usually don't have any kind of content up just because I'm not sure what type of content to make. But do you want to see more live streams of just, you know, watch parties for other games? Uh, as long as Canadian teams remain in the playoffs, do you want me to do live streams for, you know, those games? 
streams as well. Uh, and also just content in general. Do you want to see more playoff content? Are there teams that you want to see me talk about for the playoffs? Um, just let me know your thoughts in the comments. Let me know what type of content you want to see. If you want it to just strictly be Oilers, that is A-OK -okay too. Uh, I am a huge hockey fan though, and I've watched pretty much every single playoff game so far. So I would love to do a little bit more while we wait for Oilers games as well. But that's pretty much it from me today. Uh, so for closing thoughts, um, M10, businesslike. It's a business-like approach right now. Uh, enjoy the win from last night, but also understand that you know there's a lot more work that needs to be done. The playoffs are an absolute grind. This is not a sprint. Edmonton has won four games. They still need to win 12 more, so we'll see if they can get this thing done. If you liked today's video, make sure that you hit that like button. It goes a long way in supporting the channel. If you're not yet subscribed, make sure you hit that sub button. Hit that little bell so that you're always notified when I do upload a video or go live with a live stream. Uh, the live streams have been so much fun. They've been so successful. Um, I, I've had a blast during the postseason. I've had a blast on this channel in general this year. I cannot believe the growth that uh, it has experienced and the amount of support that you have all given me. Um, I am humbled every single day, so I do appreciate it. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it from me. Of course, before you head out today and, uh, you know, whether you're watching the Leafs and Bruins, um, you know, while we wait for the Oilers next opponent for round two, always tell someone that you love them. All right. I will have a video up tomorrow of something. Not quite sure yet, but I do have a couple things that I've had planned here. So, Look for something tomorrow as well, and uh, I will see you when I see you, of course. Um, and like I mentioned, if there's any type of content that you want to see, whether it's live streams or videos, just let me know what you want in the comment section below. And um, yeah, it's going to be fun. I think the rest of the playoffs are going to be fun. And for the Oilers, I think you know, no matter who they play in round two, whether it's Nashville or Vancouver, I like our chances. So I will see you all very soon. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much for tuning into all the live streams during the first round. I'm excited to uh, do more live streams once round two hits. Let's go Oilers. And I hope everyone uh, has a wonderful day. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon.